All right, cool. So welcome to the webinar today. My name is Justin Seitz. I lead up the team at Dark River Systems. We build Hunchly. And uh, today I'm going to give you a tour of Hunchly Desktop. Some of you have seen this uh, tour a hundred times and you're still back for more. This might be the first time you've ever seen Hunchly in action today or you're getting a refresher. Either way, these are not scripted. So I have a general kind of overall plan I follow, but for the rest of it, if there's topics or things you want me to dive into that are that are relevant or related to OSINT or online investigations, we'll do that. So try to make it a little fun. And there's no set time. So I schedule it for an hour. We could be done earlier. Uh, I also often hang out long after an hour to answer questions uh, if they keep coming in. All right, with that, we'll get started. Hopefully you can see everything and hear me. I'm not able to troubleshoot audio and video issues uh, at this point, but again, the recording will serve you well. If you can see my screen, you should be able to see the Hunchly dashboard. And when we're talking about Hunchly, it's actually kind of a two-part system. The first part is what you're looking at right now is our dashboard, where all of our case materials are, where we manage our cases and some of the investigative tools. And then the other part lives in our browser. And what Hunchly is really known for is a preservation tool. So the part that lives in your browser is there to preserve every page that you browse to as an investigator and make those pages court admissible later on, okay? And when we talk about browser, we mean anything that's Chromium-based. So that's Chromium, Google Chrome, which is the most popular browser out there, um, Microsoft Edge installed by default now in Windows, as well as Brave, the privacy-focused uh, browser. So Hunchly will work on all of those. Hunchly does not support Firefox, Safari, or Internet Explorer. Okay, cool. So to actually use Hunchly for what its core kind of purpose is, that web preservation tool, uh, it doesn't take very long, actually. The training's only about three or four minutes. So to get started from scratch all the way to fully trained and capturing with Hunchly doesn't take that long. And then the other like 50 minutes is me just kind of walking you through a bunch of the, the nice to haves, the gravy. So to get started, any good investigator always wants to make sure that all their cases are kept separately, right? And this might even be something that you're asked about when you're on the stand uh, presenting evidence or being cross-examined. So having a unique case is good. Feel free if you have a case management system, put the case ID in here and instead of a, a descriptor, whatever helps you put it in. In all of our demos, we investigate me for maximum embarrassment. So I've created a new case. That's all I need to do in the dashboard to get started. That's it. Just click that plus sign, click new case, fill out the case name, that's it. We can actually minimize this and go straight to our browser. All right, so now that we've got our browser open, I'm using Google Chrome here on Windows 10. Up here in the right-hand corner is where all of our extensions are. And by default, you might not see Hunchly, so you might just see this puzzle piece. And you just need to click that piece right there and then click the pin, and that's just gonna stick Hunchly right there for you in the extension bar. All right, and if we click the extension, there's only a couple more mouse clicks to get going. The first is the capture switch. So what this is telling Hunchly is now, I, when I go off and do my browsing work, I want it preserving every single page along the way. And when I'm done, I can turn it off. Okay, so you wanna make sure that the capture is turned on when you jump into your browser to start investigating or doing your research. So we're gonna turn that on. And the other mouse click is just make sure you got the right case. If you accidentally store pages in the wrong case, not a big deal. You can move them later. Um, but of course, it's a bit of a headache and can be a bit of a hassle. Uh, so just make sure you got the right case. All right, that's it. So a couple of mouse clicks in the dashboard, a couple on the extension, just to make sure everything's turned on, basically. And we're ready to start investigating. So I'm going to head to Google. And I've actually just trained you on evidence capture. So that's all that's required. Just the act of me moving from page to page is actually going to trigger the Hunchly Capture system. So there's my Pooch Riley who's saying good morning today. And we don't have to think about it. We're not clicking a button. We're not having to worry about do I screenshot this versus that. Hunchly is doing this for us. As we move around, as we scroll, as we click on additional links, Hunchly is going to be preserving all of the content from this page, including the images, the text, and the links. Okay? So to jump back to our dashboard, now we can actually see we have some data in here, right? It's telling us we've captured a couple of pages, right? We have this nice breadcrumb trail. So if you ever wanna go back and it is definitely worthwhile doing if you're preparing for court, 
go back to the beginning of your case and just walk through your history. Because it is really interesting to just see the paths you take and kind of how you move around. And it might even be useful uh, mid-investigation if you ever get stuck. Walk through your history uh, starting at the very beginning and just start walking through all the pages and see like what was I looking at? What did I find important? Sometimes that can jog your memory. So if I click on a page, this is being loaded off of my hard drive. So Hunchly gives you this little wayback machine effectively where this page is permanently going to look like this on my hard drive forever, right? So this is the cool thing is it's not loading images from the internet. It doesn't require an internet connection or anything else. Once Hunchly captures a page, it timestamps, hashes, and stores the entire thing on your hard drive. No cloud storage or anything else. So this is really good. This is a permanent copy. And you can see it looks very accurate to what we saw while we were actually on the page, right? And if we think about the witness box or sitting on the stand in court, by clicking that uh, show button on the right, this is giving us all of the information that we need to talk about what we saw, right? And that is what, the content, where, the URL, when, right? The timestamp. And the hash allows us to actually disclose this page. So this is hash is not telling us that I haven't messed with the content or modified it in some way, right? But what it will allow me to do is I can take this page, export it, and then I can send it to Julio in Chile, and Julio can hash it and validate that the act of me transmitting it to him didn't change anything, right? So this will actually not tell uh, Julio that I didn't mess with the content before I sent it. But what it is going to say is that when I sent it, it didn't in any way get changed on the way there. Okay. So these are all the critical things that are required when you have to sit in court and explain what you saw, where you saw it, and uh, and how you got it, right? So again, Hunchly takes care of all of these things for you. You don't have to think about noting times or dates or like getting a screenshot that includes the URL. Uh, it's just doing this stuff all for you in the background and storing it all locally so that you can disclose it later. Okay. Any questions about page capture or some of the setup that, uh, that I've covered so far here that I can help to answer? And I take frequent coffee breaks, so I'm going to take a coffee sip. Uh, we do have one question. Uh, just the question was, uh, I've seen a number of trainings. I've missed most of them. Are they available to view online? You bet. Uh, if you head to YouTube slash C slash Hunchly, this is where all of them will be posted. Okay, this is just our channel. Okay, I'm just going to put that into chat too. There you go. No problem. And there's other stuff I cover too, uh, you know, Maltigo, um, do some dark web webinars. So you can go, there's hours and hours of content in there that you can go check out. Perfect. All right, a question about the significance of hashes that I had just mentioned. Uh, sorry, did you, ha had you missed the part, um, had you missed part of my explanation or was there more to the question in terms of uh, an explanation around how these hashes are used? I'll pause for a minute. It gives me more coffee drinking time. Ah, yeah. So the hashes, um, what they're used for is to be able to disclose materials in court. You, hashes are a way to um, allow you to send or disclose a piece of material like a page and have the other party independently validate that that page is what you say it is, right? So they can hash it on the other side. So Hunchly here is using the SHA-256 hash. On the other side, they can grab the page, hash it, and then they will look at it and say, does it actually equal E4407821, blah, blah, blah. And if they don't match, then that means that something happened between me handing the evidence off to them. Uh, no, not quite. So basically, you have to use other hashing tools to 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 validate the hash. So the question was, do they use the hash somehow in the browser to validate it? No. And actually, for like a full kind of in-depth discussion of all of this, on our uh, knowledge base, we actually cover all of this in our evidence guide. I'm just going to send a link to everyone here. 
Okay, so what this goes over is how we capture things, the file format, the hashing, and some of the other things that we perform. And it kind of digs into what stuff is important and how to validate it, right? So how to how people can do validation work. Uh, but really the, the file hashing is just a normal, for example, like you can just type into Google like SHA-256 hash, right? And there'll be both explanations about online tools where you can like test generating your own hashes, for example, to help kind of explain how hashes are used. And really it's borrowed from mobile forensics and regular uh, old school forensics on hard drives, for example, um, where you know they're using hashes of files to, to both match against databases and to produce them as evidence. So same thing, different context. All right, cool. Awesome, 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 awesome. And right. Perfect. No more questions. We'll carry on. I think we've covered the page capture thing. Cool. Now we can talk about some of the investigative tools in Hunchly that make your life a lot easier. The first and my favorite is our selector system. So this is a very simple little tool that allows you to enter keywords that describe the subject of your investigation. So keywords meaning names could be social media user handles, for example, jms.py. Maybe you know the person's phone number, so you could add the last four digits of their phone number in. Now what's going to happen is these keywords will then be searched backwards in the case right away. So we can see here that Justin Sites already had a hit and jms.py had a hit. And we can go down here and see the little blue badge now on our history view. That's telling us there's selector hits here. Or you can click on them. And that will filter your view. This is really useful. So when we only have six pages, less so because we probably know where Justin Sites is on every page. But when you have a thousand web pages or you've been digging into something, like I've been working on a project for five months, uh, thousands of pages. And so when I discover a new piece of information, like a name or maybe a business registration number, I put that in as a selector. And then all of a sudden right here, I see a count of like 10. And I'm going, holy crap, that means that I actually saw this information at some point in the past and didn't realize its significance or it didn't mean anything to me then. And I'll just click on it and immediately jump down into my history view and start going through where I had saw that piece of information before, where that selector hit came from. Now, the other cool thing is once we have these selectors in place, as we browse everywhere we go, Hunchly is going to be looking for those terms on every single page in the underlying source code. So it's actually scanning through all the source code of the web page, looking for both of these terms. So I'll show you how this works in practice. Move along to our Bellingcat page here. Cool. So in the background, what Hunchley's already done, captured the page, timestamped it, all that fun stuff, but it's also noted that both JMS.py and Justin Sites were present on this page. So this is really nice. As I'm going, it's automatically marking pages for me with these uh, key terms and particularly if I'm tired I often will miss things right I'll be reading and reading and reading and I might just like totally miss something like skip right over it and so this is actually kind of helping to prevent those types of mistakes now visually you can look in your browser and up here you see this little red badge now with the Hunchly Chrome extension that's telling you you have selector hits and you can view them here or optionally what you can do and I'll just show this, a settings change will visually highlight them on the page for you. So down in our settings page, we can turn highlight selectors on, which will highlight them on the page and then store them, store your pages with the highlighting in place or on remove before storing. If you're in law enforcement, you want on remove before storing so that you don't have highlighting all over your evidence. If you're a journalist, a story writer, a blogger, uh, if you're working on stuff that just is not, it's not used for court, I like to leave it on. I like the highlighting in place. I like having the visual reference in my dashboard. Okay. So what does this look like? And the reason why I killed my browser, by the way, settings between the dashboard and browser can get out of sync. Just the nature of how Chrome sends messages back and forth. So when you do settings changes, I just recommend kill your browser and reopen it. If you can't, it's okay, the settings will get picked up. It can just take a bit of time. It takes a few messages to go back and forth. It's just part of the beast. Now we can see we have some highlighting on the page here. It's a little faint, it matches the style kind of underneath it. 
Okay. And if we go to here, it's pretty obvious now where the selectors are. Right? So again, I love this. I like the highlighting in place. I don't mind that it's stored, but of course, if I have to work on stuff that I know is going to be going to court or have any like remote chance of going to court, uh, then I don't use them because sometimes uh, you can, of course, you could have other terms that are highlighted that have nothing related here, and you're going to have to answer questions about why are those other terms highlighted, right? So again, it's important to understand context when you're picking some of these features as well. All right. So this is really useful. It's just doing this all on its own for me. And I often have piles of selectors. If you're ever investigating uh, corporate fraud, for example, or like groups of people, organizations, put all the members in, right? Even if it's a, like a handful of them. Reason for this is that you can start to do more analytical work using selectors. So I can say, show me pages that contain both Justin sites and ESME sites. ESME is my cat, by the way. Um, so this will tell me when both of those names maybe show up on a corporate registration or they're talking to each other on social media. All right, cool. Any questions about selectors, how to use them? All right, looks pretty quiet. We will carry on. So we can talk about tags. So tags are just a way to keep your cases organized. Now, if you're just like doing one off, uh, for example, sometimes there's teams that just get deployed when there's an event. You just got to go like capture a couple pages and produce it in a PDF. You probably don't need to categorize your pages. But for most of us who are doing even moderately complex investigations, your case can become a little unwieldy if you don't organize it. So when you start prepping for court or writing a report um, or you're doing disclosure, by having a bunch of uncategorized pages, it makes it really tedious to go through them all and pick out which ones you need. So tagging can help alleviate this problem. And how we can use tags are really flexible. So I can use something broad like social media. I can use something specific like a photo with weapon, right? Now, the other thing that you can do is if you do kind of standard investigations or, or you want to create kind of um, preloaded categories of tags and you don't want to keep creating them every single case, in your settings panel, you can come down into here and default tags. So right here, you can say, I want a social media tag for every one of my cases because I always have them. And I want a tag for, you know, corporate registrations and I don't know who is. Right. So now what will happen, every new case I create is going to have these tags pre-filled out for me. OK, so we'll just pop back to over here just so I can demonstrate this. We already created this case, so we don't see them here. But I just want to show this. I'm going to create a new case and say we are going to investigate ESME. Cool. And now you can see this ESME case already has my tag set up for me. Right. And I can just get going. I don't have to set them up all over again. So again, depending on the investigator, you may or may not use default tags, but it can be handy. So how do we apply them? Well, when we're out browsing, we can apply them from here. So as we hit you know, a new page or a new profile or whatever, we can say, okay, this is a social media page. I'm gonna tag this with social media, right? Now, of course, you can apply multiple tags if you really want to. So you can have a photo with a weapon that's also on social media naturally, right? So some people use kind of complex tagging schemes. Uh, I often just have about a half dozen very simple ones like this. So again, back in our dashboard, this is going to allow us later not only to visually see where there's a tag page, but we can filter on them. Okay, we can only see our social media pages. You can also do funny things like only social media pages that included jms.py, for example, as a selector hit. So you can mix and match your tags and your selectors to kind of analyze your case data. And you can always retroactively tag a page. So if you're in here and you're like, oh, I should have tagged this with, you know, pictures of guns or whatever, photo with weapons, sorry, pictures of guns, close enough. <laughs> you can tag it down here, uh, add or remove tags. Okay. Cool. And there's one other kind of super tag that I use, not everybody does, and that's just marking pages as important. You do this by clicking this gold star, right? Not right clicking. Clicking the gold star <laughs> right beside the case dropdown. That'll light that up. I've probably completely confused the uh, 
Yeah. Right here we have the gold star. We can see that, or you can just smack this button and it's gonna show you all of the important pages. So when I'm working with other investigators, I tell them, hey, uh, it's really useful if you hit that important button uh, on stuff that you know we're gonna report on or that we're gonna have to turn over to law enforcement. Because when I import their case, the first button I hit is this, right? And I can quickly see like what was the important stuff that they'd come across, all right? Later on, as you'll see, Having tagged pages will make your life easier for exports as well, because we can just say export all of the pages tagged with social media and be done, right? So it's a very quick and clean operation. All right, any questions about tags? Marking pages important, anything like that? Oh, we have a very interesting question. Mm. This, uh, so thanks for sending this. You met Hunchley via our dark web reporting. Um, and it looks like Hunchley works with Tor Browser. So you can't install Hunchley into Tor Browser. Uh, but what you can do is a very simple trick. So how I do it is I start Tor Browser. This is for a low security, low operational security required investigation. So I'm not worried about like a hidden service detecting that I'm running a weird configuration or anything like that. So I fire up Tor Browser. I'm just gonna run and grab a, uh, a report from today or yesterday, uh, hidden services while Tor Browser fires up. This only takes me a moment, don't worry. Okay, so then what I have is a specially crafted uh, Chrome command line. So what this command line does is it tells Chrome to proxy into the Tor Browser. So I'll just send you that command line so you all can see. I just pasted it there. Cool. Now, so when I double click Chrome Tor, now Chrome is actually going through Tor. And this right here, I believe it is. You can see actually in Google, in Google Chrome's like shortcut page right here, this is a hidden service, an insider trading hidden service. So this is on Tor. I'm going to click that. That's handy. That saves me from opening the spreadsheet, actually. It's loading, doing its thing. The Stock Insiders. Cool. All right. So I'm on tour right now on an insider trading forum there that I, of course, can't gain access to. Now let's take a look at the dashboard, which apparently I closed. And then I just fat fingered the keyboard. <laughs> there we go. I swear I do know how to use computers. This is the fun thing with webinars is that people literally get to watch how bad you are at like operating uh, mice and keyboard. So there, Hunchly has captured that hidden service page, just like a normal web page. The URL is the hidden service. Okay. There was data extracted from it. We'll get to this. Okay, so hopefully that helps to answer your question. Now, of course, if you need a higher kind of security situation, you're going to use like a 2VM setup with a Tor gateway and a bunch of other stuff. You're probably going to want to conceal your tracks a little bit more so that it doesn't look like Chrome uh, showing up um, instead of Tor browser, uh, but all totally doable. But yeah, Hunchly, as long as you give uh, a browser a Tor connection, Hunchly will be able to, to ride along just totally fine. Okay, cool. I'm gonna close. A download is in progress, that can't be good. Okay, cool. Maybe we're gonna get hacked live. No, I don't, I don't actually think so. So any other questions about that? Hopefully that helped to answer the dark web one. All right, doesn't sound like it. Let's move on. Talk about notes. So I use notes all the time in every investigation. They are a way for me to create an investigative timeline. Uh, they allow me to kind of annotate and bring context to what I'm seeing. So sorry, I had to, I keep having to close browsers. I had to, uh, my Chrome Tor one's a different browser instance than my uh, regular non-Tor connected one. So again, a note allows us to just add context to a page. So we can right click on any page and hit take note. 
this will pop this little box open where I can say, you know, Justin's author profile on Bellin Cat and hit save. So what Hunchly does is it takes a screenshot of the viewable area in our browser, or what we're looking at right now. It does a full page capture like normal, and it stores all of that uh, back behind in your dashboard. So now we have this note. So as I'm investigating, as I'm moving along, I'm constantly taking notes. You can also um, set up a keyboard shortcut. So in Chrome extensions, you can click here, keyboard shortcuts, okay? And we have Hunchly two keyboard shortcuts that you can register. So activate the extension, capture a page. So this will actually manually trigger a page capture. Take a note or toggle the auto capture so you can flip the auto capture on and off. All right, so you can configure this through your Chrome uh, extensions and Hunchly does support them. So we had to set these up specifically. All right, so that note is really useful. Again, as I'm building up a case, I will constantly even go back and take notes from uh, within my dashboard. So as I'm kind of doing case review, I will notice things that are of interest and I can take a note and on an already captured page. Right, so additional links, we'll say. The other thing that's important is that notes are the primary way we get content into our current report builder. So if you're looking to use our report builder to build out your reports or just do a quick little PDF thing, notes are the way you get content in there. We have a new report killer, uh, builder coming our next release, our next one. So. I, I don't know the date because uh, they our releases are kind of done when they're done. Uh, but very soon you're going to get a brand new report builder. I'm going to show you the, the existing one today. But just keep in mind, notes are the way you build reports in Hunchly currently. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now you can export these to PDF. Uh, you can also um, later on, you can see in our exports, you'll be able to like pull the screenshots out if you want those. Very useful, and I, again, really encourage investigators. Craig Silverman of ProPublica uh, has publicly said before, like, he takes piles. He'll have 70, 80 notes uh, in Hunchly for a, a single story that he's working on. Uh, they're just incredibly useful and great reminders to why you're looking at what you're looking at. All right? Any questions about notes, taking them, or anything like that that I can help with? Notes are awesome. Hey, Mary, good to see you. I'm glad you think notes are awesome. <laughs> cool. Any other uh, any other tidings of uh, joy for notes or anything else before I carry on? And yes, this presentation is uh, recorded. Will be posted to YouTube afterwards. Ah, uh, great question. Is it or will it be possible to use different colors for selectors? For example, not just the yellow color. Yes, we have a ticket for this and I'm gonna mention it right now. Actually, I can't, I don't have Slack open. I'm gonna take a note of it because uh, this is something we've talked about and we want and it's also for accessibility reasons. Um, and also, um, when you look at modern search tools like legal databases, if you use multiple phrases, they do break them out into different colors, and I really like that. Uh, so for a number of reasons, yes, we are going to bring that, uh, and I'm going to put another vote in um, to do that. All right? So not possible today, but yes, it's coming. <laughs> cool. Awesome. All right. Let's talk about images. So Hunchly handles images in a few different ways. Depending on how you use Hunchly, uh, there will be a few different uses for you. The first is every page you browse to, Hunchly is extracting every image off of the page. So whether that's icons, photographs, anything that's an image, it's going to pull it out. And in your Hunchly data folder, by default in your documents, we have this photos folder. This is every image we've encountered so far as we've done this presentation. Okay. So some of these things we noticed, some of these things we didn't. They're all named by their hash. If you're in law enforcement, you work on an ICE team or someone who's dealing with CSAM or abuse imagery, this photos folder, you can just chuck it into your image analysis tools. So Griffi or 
Giro or if you have other image analysis pipelines or databases, things that are Project Vic enabled, for example, um, you can use that. It will just, it's a f literally a folder full of photos that you've encountered while you were browsing. Now, as part of that extraction, what we're also doing is examining those photos and images for EXIF metadata, right? So anytime we encounter EXIF metadata, we actually pull it out for you here. Now, sometimes that EXIF metadata is actually quite useful. In this case, this picture of me, 2015, I took it with a BlackBerry. This is usually where I make fun of myself for having a BlackBerry, but damn it, I miss my BlackBerry. Um, so this can be really useful, this EXIF metadata. A, a demo, Last week, uh, we actually like geolocated William Shatner on Ars Technica uh, just by accident because I clicked on the EXIF badge and there were GPS coordinates in it. So if you ever want to reproduce that, go to ArsTechnica.com. Their homepage is full of metadata in their images. It's a great place to, to do a little test. And just scroll down and keep loading more stories until you get to the one with um, William Shatner who when he just uh, went on that spaceship ride. And they were like in the hills of Texas and the reporter must have left the geotagging on in the images. So we actually got GPS coordinates in Hunchly that we could show. So Ars Technica, again, great place to test this image data extraction. You can see we have all kinds of images here telling you about what camera took it, who took it, where they registered it from, all that fun stuff. Okay. Now, the final thing that we can do with images is we can caption them. So we can do that both here by clicking the plus button and saying nice keyboard, for example. That's gonna add that caption to that image and it's gonna be stored over here in caption images. And the other place that we can do it is from, when we're browsing, we can right click on images. Hunchly 2. Add caption to image. Bad blood. What a crazy story Theranos was. Cool. All right. Again, this can be really useful. Uh, I've worked on large complex frauds where uh, we have to do asset tracing. We're trying to find where they're storing their money. You know, like build up a whole gallery of all their boats and cars that they own. Uh, can also be useful for um, when you're doing, even if you're working on a missing persons team, uh, to build up a gallery of various pictures or, or pieces of clothing that the person might have been wearing. So this can be really useful. And these caption images as well can be used in our report builder. So you can pull them into our report builder and produce reports. All right. Any questions about any of this EXIF metadata stuff or captioning images, anything like that? All right, nothing so far. We'll move on to attachments. So attachments are anything that aren't web pages. That's it. PDFs, Word documents, video files, anything that you want to attach to a Hunchly case or you download. All right, so Hunchly does not automatically extract documents. It doesn't automatically extract videos. But if you're downloading things in your browser or if you're provided materials, you can add them into your case as an attachment. Note here as well that uh, and today we won't, but there's also Hunchly Mobile, which is free uh, for iOS and Android. It allows you to build uh, using existing materials on your mobile device or a victim or witness who it was designed for. Um, you can build little Hunchly cases using uh, images or screenshots, um, videos, that kind of thing off of your mobile device um, and get them back into Hunchly uh, Desktop. And it's really nice because it gives you hashes, allows you to annotate them, and it's a great way for people to produce evidence if they're a victim or witness instead of like sending an email with 75 files attached to all of them labeled screenshot, right? Um, so again, attachments are a really useful way of managing anything that's not a web page. So we can add them manually by clicking the Add button, picking a file off of our hard drive. Again, this can be really useful. Andrew Fordred uh, covered recently that he takes his Multigo cases when he's done with them. He then sticks it in his uh, Hunchly case as an attachment, and then he exports his whole Hunchly case, and his Multigo file goes with it. So the nice thing is here, it tells you that you added it manually, gives you the file hash. We can annotate it. So Justin 
bottle feeding. All right. Now you're probably wondering, where is this going? And if we click on this, this warning is important to heed. This is just a JPEG, but of course, if this is a backdoored Word document, a virus, or something bad, and you click OK, it's going to be game over, right? So just pay attention when you're clicking on your attachments that you're pretty confident, or at least you've scanned or done some type of, or you're using an isolated environment. This is just me uh, bottle feeding a baby raccoon. Okay, so that's worth noting. Now, the other thing that we can do is we can have Hunchly automatically attach downloads for us. Okay, so how we do that is in our settings panel, we scroll down and we have attach downloads. Okay, and it's off by default. Now we do that for security reasons. Uh, we don't want people to all of a sudden open up their case and be surprised that there's like 100 files attached. Um, so this is something you have to set yourself. Again, because it's a big settings change, I'm just going to punt the browser very quickly, close some of these other windows, and we'll just go file type docx, and we'll just say Theranos. Let's see what happens. All right, we'll download this docx right here. Now, you can see Chrome downloaded it. In our dashboard here, we now have a copy of this file. It tells us where we downloaded it from. Okay, so this is important, right? If we're going to produce it later, and we have a hash. So then I can annotate it with, you know, this is what I just downloaded, that's what this thing is, blah, blah, blah. So again, this is really useful when you're doing your investigative work, particularly if you do have to do some manual extraction of video or download video files or like binary files, super useful. Uh, I know cybersecurity researchers too, that they have their hunchly running when they download their samples and then everything stays together. Their research, the sample, everything is all together in one case. All right, any questions about attachments? All right, no questions, we'll move on. The searches panel. So what the searches panel is telling you is what you've searched for and where you search for it. So this can be looking at kind of your social media and search engines and how you're using them. Where I use it is when I hit that kind of investigative block or I hit the wall and I'm like, I don't know what else to do or I'm kind of stumped. If you jump into this searches panel, you'll often see, for example, that you leverage only one search engine, right? So I'm only using Google there. Whereas we know that being a good investigator means running your searches on other search engines. And Yandex will provide significantly different results in most cases. So all kinds of stuff. That's not me. Model with the same name as me. But you'll note that they feature his imagery far more prominently than mine, than on Google, right? Um, so again, this is telling me to be a more thorough investigator to actually use other search engines, maybe run these things on social media. Uh, I often will take a look at my search terms and then also look at my selectors and realize like I haven't Googled for Esme sites yet, for example. So again, this is just a convenience thing and also a thing to encourage investigators, you know, to be more thorough, to kind of make sure you're, you're exploring all the different opportunities for keyword searches. All right, cool. Any questions about that before I move on, I guess? If, so um, another kind of, I guess, part question is, uh, if you change country or change your geographic location, uh, do you still appear, does it still appear in Google without changes? So uh, I'm not entirely sure if you're referring to, like, do you see a change in how Google responds to the, uh, does it respond to the different, like, search queries based on country? Generally, it does. Uh, if you switch locales or if you use a VPN or something or even through Tor and run the same queries against Google, often you will see different results um, depending on country. Uh, but I actually haven't done that in a while, uh, for the last while, uh, just simply because a lot of my stuff's been local. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, great. 
question answered, I hope. And again, if I'm not doing a good job of answering a question live here, feel free to send me an email afterwards as well. Just justin at hunch.ly. No problem. Cool. All right. Let's talk about the data tab. So when you're browsing around, Hunchly is actually examining not only for selectors, uh, but looking at the source code for little pieces of data that might be useful to kind of pivot on or to throw into some other tool. And that can be anything from Google Analytics tracking codes, hidden services that we've been able to find references to, email addresses, right? So this email address here came from that hidden service. Interesting, right? Because email addresses do allow us to then go out into the surface web and start investigating. So this data tab is really there to kind of give you ideas, to kind of make you think about like, where can I use this information? Like Google Analytics codes, you can put into Multigo, you can use on analyzeid.com. Um, so a lot of this stuff is really just these little nuggets that we're pulling out, bringing them forward to you so that you can use them in other services or other tools. All right, and they're just regular expression. Okay, questions, nothing? All right, just a couple things here I'll read through. Hmm. Yes, I also just have a, a couple of questions or at least um, um, technical support related stuff. Yes, please. Uh, our support line is support at hunch.ly and our team is amazing. So feel free to reach out to them and they'll be able to help you with any install or upgrade issues for sure. All right, cool. We're on the home stretch. Let's talk about exports. So the first and most important button to click here is the export case button. So I do this every day. If I'm working on anything uh, significant, I export my case at the end of the day. And it just produces this zip file, right? It's not some opaque, weird data structure. It's just a zip file. You can open it. In fact, we encourage people to open them. All right. Give it a sec. So what's in here? Well, everything is clearly labeled. So if you want to find that Theranos document, it's right there. All of that stuff is labeled clearly for you. For the data nerds, in the case data folder, there's going to be CSV and JSON files of all the data that's underlying in the case information if you want to process it or do anything. And the great thing is there's this report, which when you send an export to somebody, they can import the thing into Hunchly, but if they don't have Hunchly, they can just open this report. This will give them a very basic dashboard that they can scroll through, take a look at your case, I can hear Riley coming. You can probably hear him too. He's massive. So sorry if there's jingling in the microphone. Um, and this is going to show you all of the materials. This is not loaded off the internet. Okay, so I can cut the internet to this virtual machine. This all works totally fine. And it does allow people to do offline case review. They can see your notes, your photos, attachments. All right. So again, this embedded dashboard is incredibly useful and it all just rides along inside of this export. Later on, after, you know, as most cases go, you do your thing, you kind of stop and then court shows up like 18 months later or whatever. Um, the great thing is I can just keep this on my backup server. And when I need to, I can import it back into Hunchly. So I can just say import case. I can import it as a new case or I can merge it with an existing case. Okay, pick the zip file, and then that's it. Import it, I can go grab a coffee, come back, and my dashboard will be loaded up with everything as if it was the first day, or sorry, the last day I had started investigating. Not the first day, because that would be bad. That would mean you have no pages captured, so. Cool, so that export is incredibly important, and once you delete something from Hunchly, it's gone. Okay, so uh, it's also important um, to, to know that, that we don't have like an undo button uh, anywhere because uh, when investigators need to remove things, particularly in the European Union, they need to be gone. They need to be gone, gone. Uh, we do keep a deletion log though. So if you delete something, you need to explain it later. There's a deletion log that tells you what you deleted, but the actual content is no longer there. All right, 
Cool. Any other questions or anything about exporting cases or re-importing them back in? All right, and it's worth mentioning too, that report that I showed you, the uh, little embedded dashboard, Hunchly Mobile has that as well. So when you export your case from Hunchly Mobile, you can just send that zip file to the investigating officer or an attorney, and they can just open it, and it's got a little dashboard where you can go through all of the mobile attachments that they've assembled. All right, cool. We can talk about some custom export options. So the thing that most of our customers do here is they're looking for page export, okay? Selective export is kind of this mismatch of, you can pick and choose various things, like I want my notes in a PDF, and I want my caption images, and just the pages marked important, right? So you can kind of pick and choose. Most folks are in here clicking on page export. This is where tags and that important marker are really useful, because we can, of course, just say, I just want photos with weapons in them, that's it. Or you can say all pages if you want. That's also nice and convenient. But having those tags and those categories really help here. And when you select these, it's going to produce a PDF and an MHTML file. So I'll just hit this. And we'll uh, send those off. I don't even remember what we captured there, what we tagged. <laughs> cool. And so that's going to produce both of them into this exported pages folder. By tag. And now we have PDF and an MHTML file. So if I open the PDF, it's going to look a little different than the MHTML because we have this header. Sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. Sorry, Siri, I'm busy right now. <laughs> My watch uh, yelling at me. So the uh, I know right now everybody's laughing at me in the in the Q and A boxes. It's it's great. Thank you. Uh, so on PDFs, you get this this header that gives you the information about the page, right? Um, and it's nice, but PDFs were never really designed to display web content, so you can get all kinds of weird artifacts or stuff that just is not doesn't look right. Uh, most of the time it's okay, some of the time it's really bad. Now that's why we also produce the MHTML, which generally has a better view of what you saw at the time, right? You can see this is actually more representative of what we saw when we were on that page. So both of those go out when you do those tag-based exports. Now, if you just want to kick out a couple pages or you're kind of in the midst of something and you just want to pluck a few things out here and go page export, you can do that from the history view. Same deal. You're going to get PDF and MHTML files when you do this. Just hit select folder. It will kick just those two pages out for you and you can send them to your colleagues or whatever you need to do. Or if you're in a page itself, there is this little export page button and you can select MHTML or PDF. Okay, so that is the most common thing. Folks do need to get pages out of Hunchly once they've been captured. Otherwise, it's not super useful. So do you have any questions about any of that so far before I crack open the report builder and we uh, ride off into the sunset here? My audio just dropped. That's a, that's a fantastic time for that to happen. Great. Okay, no questions. Great. Cool, coffee sip time. All right, so before I crack open, uh, oh, hold on a second, perfect. Before I crack open the report builder, I wanna show you a few settings. Again, this report builder is gonna change very soon, so uh, I want this in your like immediate memory but not stored in your long-term memory. Down here in reporting, you can set your organization name, put a logo in, and a document classification. So if you need like top secret stamped in the header and footer of every page produced, that's what you put in the classification box. And the other thing that we can do is you'll see we, we build our reports in sections, just like any report really. Uh, and you can, much like our default tags, we can set up uh, a bit of a report template. So we can say like, I always wanna have an executive summary section and I always want like an evidence section, and I'm always gonna have a conclusion. Same deal, every new case we create from here on out is gonna have these three sections waiting for us in the report builder. All right, so let's crack it open. Now I designed this, which explains why uh, at times it can be extremely frustrating to use, uh, but 
professionals design the new one, so you'll be much happier with it, trust me. What we have is a drag and drop interface. So you just drag and drop stuff from the left to the right. So here we can put the report title and we'll just put Justin Sites, that was it. Now, here's how I use the report builder. Is it very simple. Most of the time, I just have one section. You can label it whatever you want by changing it there. You can add text to it if you want. So you can add text in like, check this stuff out. Okay. And here's what I do. I crack down the notes option and I grab the all notes, pop them in. You can do one at a time if you want. And then I grab all captioned images and drop those in. And then I export to DocX. And the reason for that is that I have a report template that I've built over years of work uh, and it's in Microsoft Word already. So I open my Hunchly report on the left, I open my existing template on the right, and then as I'm authoring my report, I'm pulling elements from my Hunchly report over. All right. Now, if you need to build a quick kind of summary thing or just a one pager, you can kick these things out to PDF, of course. You can make multiple sections and all of that. But what you will notice is that if you try to build a big complex report using this report builder, it will be frustrating. And I apologize for that in advance. So if you stick to simple reports, it's totally fine. For complex ones, not so great. But that's what the new report builder is coming for. And if we look at this report very quickly, your logo and organization name would appear up here. There's our case name when it was prepared. Table of contents. Check this stuff out. There's our first note. Okay, so it's nice because in Word, this is all just a nice big table. I can grab, pull over, resize, do whatever I want, or just the image or whatever I need, depending on what I'm writing. Same deal for images, and the EXIF metadata comes into a table too, so that you have that available. All right, and that is our report builder. Cool. So we have a few minutes left. I'm not seeing any questions piling up. Nothing wrong with getting out of here early. But if there are any questions, I'm going to wait for a minute here as I uh, sip some coffee and um, relax. And I'll leave the line open for about a minute. Otherwise, I'm going to shut it down. And I hope to see you all again on a future webinar where we'll cover something else probably. Boom. You're, you're very welcome. You're all very welcome. And again, just to reiterate some of the resources, if for those of you who are still hanging around, hunch.ly is our main website. Our knowledge base is at support.hunch.ly. Yeah. Hunchly.training as well. If you want to learn some more advanced tricks, you want to write some code, some automation behind Hunchly, uh, we have courses available. There are more courses coming that we are working on. All kinds of wild and wonderful stuff. Excellent. Oh yes, and our dark web uh, mailing list. If you scroll to the bottom of our web page, dark web mailing list, it's free. You just pop your email in and once a day we'll send you our uh, hidden service scan results. Cool, and yeah, you can sign up to our mailing list. You'll make sure that you'll get your webinar notifications and anytime there's new releases and all kinds of fun stuff there as well. Cool, cool. All right, I'm gonna shut it down. Thank you so much for showing up. I'll see you next week and come and say hi to me on Twitter. All of you, for sure. Come say hi, jms.py. That's where I spend most of my, I know, I know Mary says hi. Mary says hi all the time. Everyone as well. Mary, all the Marys. <laughs> yeah, this is recorded, so it will be posted again. I should have mentioned this too. Our YouTube channel 
is just YouTube slash C slash Hunchly, or you can just punch Hunchly into the search bar. It will take you to our channel. And then we have videos here on Multigo, desktop training, advanced Multigo stuff, dark web investigations, all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, you can go check out OSINT Curious. I hang out on there occasionally as well. A very good resource, a bunch of great people. Um, yeah, so YouTube is full of OSINT goodness as usual. Awesome, awesome, perfect. No problem. Yeah, and uh, this uh, as soon as we're done here, the recording will start encoding. It takes me a day or two usually to get everything uploaded, but we'll send out a, a notification and watch the main Hunchly Twitter account too as we post uh, the recordings there. It's just twitter.com slash Hunchly. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. If you need anything else, it's just justin at hunch.ly. I'll be happy to help you out. Have a great one. See you. Thanks, Chris. Bye-bye.